Welcome to Free Kiwis. We're extremely honoured today to be joined by Professor Kathleen Stock, now of the University of Austin, I believe. Is that right, Kathleen? I'm a visiting fellow there, yes. Uh, I'm not full-time, so I'm okay. not moving to Texas, but yes, I am uh, happy to be associated with them and represent them. Excellent. Now, uh, you're reasonably well known as somebody who is critical of the idea that people can change sex by decree. Uh <laughs> and we, it's very timely that we, we talk to you now uh, following recent events in here in New Zealand. Uh, Posey Parker uh, recently visited and had a fairly tough time of it in Auckland where uh, she and her supporters were surrounded by a violent mob and uh, an elderly woman was put in hospital with a broken eye socket by some of the people who were there to protest her presence. Uh, mm -hmm. And then... A few days later, our Prime Minister Chris Hipkins was asked by a somewhat mischievous journalist to define a woman, and he looked like a rabbit in the headlights, and he kind of stuttered and stammered. He said, uh, gender, uh, sex, uh, biology, and before finally lighting on what he saw as the only possible way out, which was to say that people define their own gender. So I think you might have an argument with with that. <laughs> yes, I do. Um so would you like me to comment on on any bit of that? Yeah, particular? maybe let's just start with the, with the Posey Parker episode. So you're someone who's had a bit of experience in this in this fight, I suppose it's become, unfortunately. So what's your reaction to what happened to Posey Parker in Auckland? Well, I think um, it's a manifestation of a dynamic that we see all over the place at the moment where women are denied, women in particular who are critical of trans activism and the radical claims of trans activism are denied um, the right to free expression. Uh, and even worse, um, they are threatened or with violence, or in this case, there was actual violence. Um, and it's negated by onlookers as, as something that they deserved. Uh, which is really quite striking because the people saying that these women deserve what comes to them are self-styled progressive social justice warriors who are always telling us to be kind <laughs> and inclusive, <laughs> but it, they don't seem to extend those uh, sentiments to women in particular who speak out of line, who dissent, who disagree, because of course women are supposed to be the sex that are paradigmatically kind and inclusive in, a, in this case, doormats. <laughs> so um, in Posey's case, she she, go, she goes around uh, setting up microphones for women to say what they think about gender activism. And that's quite revolutionary in a climate where institutionally you really aren't allowed to say what you think without some kind of social penalty. So she's, she's um, acting on behalf of women and their free speech. And um, in this case, I found it very shocking, the the ferocity of the the response to her. And also I found it particularly shocking that the police were so inactive because that suggests to me the police have been, you know, captured by this ideology too. It really was quite appalling. And I heard a few days after that event, the police liaison person for Speak Up for Women, which was the organisation that had invited mm -hmm. her here or was hosting her, and she, she said that when she approached an officer when the violence was occurring, uh, that the mm -hmm. officer responded, we're not here to protect you. And at that point, yeah. my jaw dropped through the floor because, it, I mean, I agree with all, all that you've said. And even worse, we have a, a media that pointed the cameras the other way when this violence was going on. Mm -hmm. And we, Absolutely. Ha we have some members of parliament who were abetting the mob, uh, who were there to abet the mob. And yes. it, just, it started to remind me, I mean, I don't want to be hyperbolic and it's not quite in the same territory, but it, it's a little bit like Kristallnacht. When it, where, once you've got, a, yeah. you've got people serving in the government abetting a protest, you've got police ignoring violence being committed yeah. During that protest, you've got something very strange going on. Definitely yeah. something very strange going on. I mean, it reminds me of um, the witch hunt kind of environment where uh, suddenly, what in other contexts would look like reasonable actions, like standing with a microphone uh, in a public place, just speaking, takes on this um, sinister 
uh, kind of it's pre- depicted in people's minds as highly sinister and justifying whatever violence then comes to these women. And they didn't, you know, the onlookers, the media, the police did not get that way by accident. It's happened over the last 10 years that this ideology has crept in under the guise of kindness and inclusivity. Um, and it's really m- making people lose their minds yeah. <laughs> and lose their judgment we as probably, well, lose their judgment about what's reasonable and what isn't reasonable. We probably haven't quite reached the level of violence of Kristallnacht or s- uh, some of the witch hunts. No, we mean, haven't. We definitely haven't. Well, and I'm always a bit myself a bit um, wary of, you know. Well, uh, I, I do agree that you know, <laughs> analogies. It's, it's worrying enough that you have, you know, an elderly woman punched, an elderly man who was elbowed, although he does seem to have had some, been involved in some minor violence of his own. Um, and Posey had uh, had stuff, soup thrown over her. Did. I mean, it's it was generally a violent episode. It clearly was, and and I was shocked when I saw a New Zealand media outlet that seemed reasonably uh, well established denying that there had been violence, saying it was peaceful, and they seemed to be just simply uh, adverting to the authority of a trans activist who had been there. But the video was so obviously not peaceful. People breaking through barriers and running at the women. Yeah. And then this man punching this woman in the head repeatedly. So that, that it's really getting to an Orwellian point where, you know, as the as the Orwellian saying goes, I can't remember exactly, but you know, denying the evidence of your eyes and ears. You will be asked to deny the evidence yes. of your eyes and yeah, ears. The party's last and that's what's and happening. most essential command was to deny the evidence yeah. of your senses. Yeah, that's right. How, how yeah, many exactly. fingers am I holding up? Yes. That, that was, that <laughs> yeah, was, that, I mean, really, sheer propaganda at this stage. There, there were some journalists I heard on Radio New Zealand. They were actually from the New Zealand Herald, but they were talking about the day. And they said, well, we didn't really see anything because we were covering the protest, <laughs> but we were with all the people who were kind of enjoying the day. And I'm sure there were a lot of people who were just enjoying the day. But for me, you know, what reporters do is they go to where the action yeah, is taking exactly. place, right? So, And it's really your responsibility exactly. as a journalist. If there's something out of the ordinary happening, like an old woman getting punched in the face repeatedly or someone having yeah. tomato juice thrown over her, your duty is really to go to that and, and notice it yeah. and, and write about it, right? Uh, so, And they know it. that. I mean, you can't imagine a war reporter saying, well, you know, I hear there was some stuff that went on in the front lines, but, you know, I was just at the back having a nice time in the hotel bar. You know, I mean, people know in every other context that that would look like cowardice and laziness. But in this context, it's somehow supposed to be noble. <laughs> you know, it's crazy. So so it would seem. It. And just to, to, to revisit the Crystal Knacks reference briefly, I, I didn't mean... Uh, by that comment that I thought the violence was anywhere near as bad. My point, know, my point is a collusion between people in power, between yeah. gov- government members of the government, between the media and seemingly the police to mm-hmm. allow criminal violence yeah. to take place in, in the name of an ideology. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it happens in many, many contexts and perhaps we don't notice it as starkly um, you know, for various blind prejudicial reasons of our own, we might not notice it where it's happening in other places, but I certainly see it in this case. Yeah. Um, yeah. So clearly. it's interesting. We've been talking about how the police sort of just stood there and didn't do anything. And that's obviously very worrying because the state is meant to be neutral and it's meant to support liberal rights as like free, free speech. Mm-hmm. And so that just takes us to the next episode that Michael mentioned where the prime minister of New Zealand, Chris Hipkins was asked by Sean Plunkett, a local journalist, basically to say what a woman was and and he had this kind of brain freeze i I almost felt a bit sorry for him because he was clearly thinking like what do i say in this situation has become so fraught but but what did you make of his sort of failure to say anything coherent um well i'm familiar with this uh this phenomenon uh because it's become a tactic of uk journalists recently which i applaud to just confront um politicians with this what looks like a very simple question and should Mm -hmm. be a simple question to answer but um it, it just immediately demonstrates the extent to which politicians are beholden to activism that they cannot give the straightforward answer that you know most of us know is true. Um, now, I did. He prevaricated about gender and sex, right? You know, I mean, there's a lot of spurious um, pseudo intellectual arguments given at this stage for. Uh, women is not a sex; it's a gender. Women is a social construct. <laughs> Obviously, nobody seems to make the same arguments to the same extent with men, and I think that's interesting data in itself. Mm. Um, in the UK, um, the La- Labour Party in particular has had a terrible time with this question. 
um, giving a variety of answers, you know, denying the Labour leader denying at one point that you could say that um, a woman was only women had cervixes uh, in response to a question. And recently, in the most recent iteration of the answer, he has said that 99. 5% of women don't have penises or something, well, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> getting, getting a little bit closer to the truth, perhaps. <laughs> well, Le- Inching yeah. there, little by little. Inching there slowly. Yeah. Yes. So uh, with the all men have penises thing, I mean, so what do we make of, I was teaching my students the other day, because I also teach in the classics department, about this uh, Zheng He, this Chinese admiral who was active in mm-hmm. the, I think in the 16th century, he did all these fantastic sort of explorations, went to Africa, got a giraffe back to the emperor of China. But anyway, one of the things he was, besides a Muslim and a Chinese admiral, was a eunuch. So he had a male mm-hmm. appendage. He was a male. They cut it off. So he's a man mm-hmm. without a penis, right? So uh, that's why I, I sometimes yeah. sympathize with people saying, well, most of the time men don't ha- men have penises. And, and Well, no one says all men have penises because they can easily think of examples where men have had their penises cut off. But you could say that only men, there's a difference between all and only, right? Only men have penises. The people that have penises, you know, out of those people, there are no women. (laughs) (laughs) Um, In the same way that, I mean, what trans activism asks you to do constantly is to uh, equivocate between all and only. So... um, they will say, of course, all women don't have uteruses. And, and my side will say, yes, we bloody know that. You know, mm-hmm. why on earth would we make such a ridiculous claim in the first place? But we know that oh, the people out of the people that do have uteruses, we know that they are all women. Um, and that's a, so there's some basic logical uh, fallacies going on in, in this quite often. They also mix up necessary and sufficient conditions and yes. stuff that you, in first year logic you would have uh, hoped to find out with philosophy students. But yeah, we, do it well we, we certainly don't look for, for much logic for, from that quarter. But I do think as no. well that there's a confusion in the mix here, uh, which is what the word gender really means, because it, it has yes. come to be used as a synonym for sex, which, which it isn't. Uh, and I, I, well, it, well, yeah. yeah I, mean, on, I, I mean, perhaps perhaps people could use it that way, but it seems to mean something like the social construction of an I- identity as opposed to the mm-hmm. biological state of a body so we might say with 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 a vanishingly small number of chromosomal exceptions human beings are either male or female uh yeah but, but then we have this idea of gender overlaid on that as as some sort of identity ca- category w- which is socially constructed is is that how you see it or um, I think the word gender is um, almost fatally ambiguous these days between about four different meanings. Um, so actually, I think, uh, from my understanding, historically, gender back, you know, in the early 20th century, the 19th century, gender was a synonym for sex. Um, it was a sort of polite I see. Uh, word for sex, if you didn't want to say S-E-X, you know, is that that's a word that is also ambiguous between biology and uh um, sexual intercourse. Sure. So, uh, so there was that, and when so I think when passports ask for your gender, they mean your sex on average. Most passports, uh, most countries' passports, they mean male or female. But um, then things got complicated because in the seventy, the, well, the sixties and seventies, second wave feminism introduced uh, this concept of gender as the social meaning of sex, the social norms, the social stereotypes around sex, which can vary from culture to culture, um, and his and throughout history, and are not fixed. Um, then, uh, at the same time, um, people like John Money, that is a psychologist working with children who have variations of sexual development, sometimes called intersex. Um, they they invented or constructed this concept of gender roles and gender identity as something like inner that's supposed to represent the you know the sex you feel you are independently of the facts about you, mm-hmm. and that was introduced to talk about children whose bodies were very ambiguous, but then it quickly was used to talk about uh, normal people or I'm mean, no, sorry not normal people but, you know or the the typical case um, and trans people as well. So gender started to mean all sorts of different things. And now gender identity isn't treated by all trans activists even as social. It's sort of sort of as innate as so, something that you're born with. Some kind of spirit. So 
Yeah, well, we've reverted back to a biological kind of essentialist account, except that now sex isn't the biological thing or the essentialist thing. It's gender identity that you're born with and that somehow bursts out of you at some point. And it may be at odds with the facts of your body. And, the bo- um, and they're and a bit the vague about can, what the facts... The bodies can then be altered to to come into line can. With, with that. Well, they can, um, but they don't have to be. According to radical trans activism, you you know you could tell me I'm I'm I've got a female gender identity. I am a woman, and I should take that um, as true. Uh, both of those claims as true, even if you never have any surgery or do anything. Even yeah. maybe you just carry on dressing the way you do and looking the way you do, but you're still a woman because your gender identity is female. Now you know at this point we've moved it into the realm of the absolutely preposterous. <laughs> yeah. But, but um, this is, I'm afraid, what radical trans activists would have you believe. And that is exactly why your prime minister is um, sta- stammering <laughs> when being asked about what a woman is because yeah. of this view that he knows is in the air. Well, yes, so I know. Like, we've also sort of almost moved into the realm of the pragmatic, though, when you're talking about how the very radical view is just that you can declare your your sex or your, your gender, I suppose, and people have to respect it. But it sounds mm-hmm. like you think, and this uh, strikes me as a more sensible approach, you think that there are kind of gradations to this. Like we may want to respect people claiming that they're a woman or wanting to be treated like a woman in certain situations and not in others. And it may depend on whether the person's had certain types of surgery. You know, I'm thinking in particular of mm. uh, things like access to, to female-only uh, spaces. So... What well, my view is much more complicated than that, I'm afraid. So, um, so first of all, I would want to distinguish between is a woman and is treated as a woman, right? Yes. Because I'm not going to collapse those two things. I don't think being a woman is a social treatment. <laughs> you know, I don't think me being a woman depends on how people treat me. And if I was treated as a man, it wouldn't make me a man. So I'm afraid I'm pretty hard line. Well, I think it's you have to be on whether males can become females and females become males uh, they can't. <laughs> so um, so men and women are determined by biology. Uh, that's how the categories work. That's how they've worked in every natural language. And there's a really good reason we have those categories, because we are a sexually dimorphic species that reproduces through um, intercourse between males and females. And we need categories that keep those fixed. And I don't think you become a woman by having surgery and having artificial breasts. Uh, having your penis chopped off, having um, an artificial vagina put in. Uh, I don't think you become a woman by having um, exogenous hormones. I think you're a man who has had those things. Yeah. Right. That's that I see. I just don't think the categories can work if we start moving them to uncover artificial cases. However, that's not to say that we might not, um, you know, treat you as a woman in inverted commas as in go into a fiction as far as i'm concerned that you have changed sex for certain defined purposes um and most of the time for most of my life i've been relaxed about that question and i've never felt particularly bothered about um sharing particular spaces with trans women who have gone through a very you know quite uh radical kind of physical change. Um, But I still wouldn't say they were women, literally speaking, and I certainly wouldn't want to compete against them in sport, for instance, because they still have a big advantage over me that they got through testosterone at puberty. And I actually wouldn't want to relax rules about domestic violence refuges or rape crisis centers. um, Much less prisons, right? Well, certainly not prisons. And so it, it was already complicated enough. But then we got this extra ridiculous claim that they don't even need to have any surgery. They're just women because they feel they are. And, you know, there are rapists in pris- female prisons right now who have not had any surgery or hormones yeah. and are in close quarters with female prisoners. Now, that I think that's incredibly unjust on those prisoners. Yeah. And um, things have gone badly, badly wrong. And in fact, I mean... It- Possibly it was the issue that cost Nicola Sturgeon her job, right, as, as First Minister of Scotland. Well, possibly, yes. Is that it? and the money that they seem to have lost. Right. But, um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, it's been a big scandal because actually um, 
people like me have been saying, look, this will happen or is happening for quite a few years now. And it is. And I don't know what I actually don't know much about the prisons in New Zealand, but I know that there are plenty of male offenders in female prisons in Canada, for instance. I know there are some in Ireland. I know there are still some in the UK. I know there are lots in California. So, you know, it's happening. Yeah. Um, and nobody's really believed us because it seems so ridiculous. You know, how can you how can a male rapist who's been convicted or worse, you know, murder, uh, paedophiles. They've been convicted of these crimes that are sex crimes against women. You know, between uh, arrest and conviction, they say, oh, I'm a woman now. <laughs> and the judge says, you know, to the, to the victims, well, you must respect her pronouns. And then says, right, you can go into the female prison estate. It's it's absolutely crazy. It, it <laughs> and, really is. Um, that makes a mockery of social justice. It yeah. makes a mockery of social justice. It's very but much. It is the, happening. Very much that Orwellian territory where, where people have assimilated a falsehood yeah. to the extent that they uh, can't even face up to it in a situation like that, where it's it's such no. an obvious ploy to to get yeah. a access to, you know. Anything really? <laughs> yeah, well, that's right. And I, I believe you've you've um, referred to this idea of of men uh, being women as an immersive fiction, which a, a phrase I really quite liked, and it, it put me in mind of uh, Mary Harrington actually ta talking about the ways. And I mean, this is a more general point, I suppose, a context for it that we've created a situation now where we do modify our bodies and the way we interact with people. I think she said the pill, actually, the contraceptive pill was the, the beginning of mm. this, a technology that we'd produced that allowed women to alter their biology and, and thereby their lifestyles in a way mm -hmm. that was unprecedented in history. And since then, we've gone on to invent virtual reality and it seems to be fast heading towards uh, robots that we can't tell apart from humans and perhaps cyber appendages to our, our bodies. It makes me wonder mm. where all this is headed. We're, we're kind of unmooring ourselves from biology more and more. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think I agree with Mary about the pill um, on that specific issue. I think that we've been messing about with our biology for a lot longer than that. I mean, I think in a sense, the um, the whole project of medicine I mean, it depends on how you define biology, obviously, but there's mm. biological process. Yeah. Most medical, uh, most uh, illnesses are biological processes in some sense. That's so, true. Um, yeah. And they're certainly inflected by uh, chromosomes so uh, and hormones. So um, I think, I think, you know, you can be a, you can be a purist in both directions in this, as in all <laughs> issues. You can be a hundred percent gung ho for the transhumanist project and think that the body is just basically a kind of straight jacket that has been imposed on us unjustly and you know it's, it's it, we should break all the barriers of the physical barriers why should we let uh sex biological sex uh constrain who we really are and all that you know i think clearly things have gone way too far at this point we're in denial about our animal natures um if we think like that and we are animals yeah. however I, you know, I'm not going to become a um, an, a Christian scientist or an anti-vaxxer or a or someone who thinks that the pill shouldn't be given out to to, to women um, myself. You know, I, because I think you can go a purist, become a purist in the other direction. But we aren't just uh, animals like any other animals. We have massive prefrontal cortexes yeah. that allow us to uh, invent medical technologies. Um, we have to just kind of try and work out where the balance is. And what I think Mary is right about is that um, we need to think about the consequences properly of the technologies that we bring in. And the pill changed enormous amounts for women and men. Yeah. Um, it changed the balance of sexual relationships in many ways. And I think we look we need to look all of that in the face. Um, we just don't seem to be very good at actually dealing with the anxiety that some of these um, technologies bring and we want to deny it we want to just sort of never admit the costs <laughs> and to that and to and, and you can see that in the in the whole idea of medical transition because there are huge costs to um people that have been through medical transition you know they are they are patients for the rest of their lives yeah and there are costs to their families as well which we don't talk about very much so generally right. speaking we could
conversation, I think. So what, one of the things that's often stressed uh, by the other side is that they need to do, go through these transitions because the mental health effects of not doing them are so disastrous. That's the claim anyway. And often there are these figures bandied about about the rates of suicide for people who don't transition. So it sounds like you're quite mm-hmm. skeptical of that, of that side of the equation. Do you think that those claims are exaggerated? Well, they're clearly ex- and about suicide because the evidence is just not there to support them. In fact, um, increasingly there's evidence to show that transition might, um, you know, in some cases anyway, exacerbate mental health issues. And you know, also there's this vastly suppressed fact that, um, especially in the realm of teenagers and young um, uh, people who have gender dysphoria, which means basically just being feeling very, very ill at ease with your sex body, um, and feeling like it doesn't belong to you and that somehow there's something's gone wrong. <laughs> you should have been some other way. You don't want to be a woman or a man. You want to be either the opposite or neither of those things. Um, that people desist, <laughs> you know, that, that, is a, that it's often, very, very often a phase, a distressing phase, um, but it, it's a phase that needs to be um, considered in a much bigger context of worsening uh, mental health for teenagers, generally speaking, hugely. So, and, and people are tracing it to the introduction of smartphones and um, social media. And it's particularly bad for girls, females. <laughs> you know, uh, they are trans identified at a much higher rate than males. Yep. So that's a sex based difference that we can't talk about if sex isn't talked about. So, um, there's a big mental health crisis in young people and um, suicide rates are up generally, but there's no, um, or attempted suicide and suicide ideation is is rampant. But but what the trans activist movement will do was hone in on, you know, a certain cohort and will give a very simplified explanation, which is they are feeling suicidal because you won't let them transition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or because they don't have a, a quick enough access to medical transition. And the only way to save them from suicide is to give them what they want. And these, you know, these, again, these principles would never fly in any other area of psychiat- psychiatry or, or psychology. No one would say just give in like blackmail to a group of distressed people and give them what they want because they know best. Yeah. But um, but for some reason, the real rules do not apply here. People have lost their minds. <laughs> yeah, I think it is, so, worth, it is worth actually thinking about young people in particular uh, Mm -hmm. in relation to this issue. I I mean, obviously, you know, these rapists who suddenly decide that they're women uh, at Uh sentencing and so on, they they tend to be older men, maybe not necessarily Mm -hmm. that much older, but they're they're kind of one category. But then if we look at adolescents, I I mean, adolescents often have obviously fraught relationships with their bodies, whether they're boys or girls, they're going through a, a change which is it's sometimes upsetting and, and makes things uncomfortable and so on. So I guess we can see why that's a time of life when this would be a particular yeah. vulnerability. And of yeah. course, the, we can go back a, a couple of decades and see young women inclined to cut themselves or, or mm-hmm. have eating disorders and, and things like that as a kind of rebellion against their bodies changing perhaps mm-hmm. and I, I i believe there's a kind of social contagion of that to an extent through social groups yeah and and, yeah. It, and it seems to be another manifestation of of that with, with potentially even more serious or actually eating disorders can be fatal so i don't want to say even more serious but certainly if we're going down the road of even encouraging mm-hmm. them to take hormones and and have mastectomies and so on. Yeah, that that that's that's pretty harmful. And and then there's the the young men as well. And I I listened to your interview with Kim Hill, who uh, is a radio journalist here in New Zealand, uh, which was I, I thought some missed opportunities in that conversation. Really, she she seemed more out to just. Uh, show her credentials as a, a right thinking person by by putting you down the, than anything but she she asked the question at one point why would a, a man who is privileged by his sex ever want to change into a woman other than because he had a, a really <laughs> co- a really compelling uh, reason to in terms of his identity and it occurred to me but, that actually if we're talking about adolescent boys they don't necessarily feel like they're hugely privileged. privileged. As, no, of as, course they don't. Especially with the circles they now move in. If you're a white, heterosexual boy, you're pretty yeah. much at the bottom of the woke pecking order. 
and you can yeah. transport yourself to the top of it <laughs> by simply yes and i don't blame them at all either i mean i don't think I, I completely agree with you. And I think what Kim said there, uh, I don't remember, but if that's what she said, then that's just a stunningly simplified, <laughs> oversimplified account of male psychology, which for 50% of the population, it seems like a bold claim. Yep. Um, but yeah, there's, a, there's well, first of all, boys um, like girls are going through a mental health crisis too. Um there's there's just there's a huge number of factors going on that we really don't have much idea about yet. You know, they are at home much more. They are um, they're not they're not exposed to the normal kind of rites of passage and challenges that my generation was as as often. They often don't you know have a Saturday job. They're very stressed with work. They watch a lot of porn. They watch a lot of TV. They they don't socialize in groups as much. They don't they don't go through the kinds of um, early uh, you know late adolescent challenges like drinking and smoking and apparently they don't don't even have much sex anymore (laughs) no they don't have as much sex anymore they're not losing their virginity as early there's a kind of phenomenon which is sometimes called failure to launch where they just can't get out of the familial home they could say in britain they can't afford to get out of the familial home because there aren't enough houses that are affordable for them um so there's a big set of crises around and there's a lot of anxiety in the air and they grew up in a time where um social media was available they also grew up around me too yeah you know so when maybe their first exposure to the the war of the sexes was a bunch of women saying um that men are rapists and men are sexual assault assaulters and and you know i I have sons and i they are beautiful sensitive boys who um who take on what the world thinks of them, <laughs> you know, as, as boys do, most boys do, um, as girls do, you know, I mean, I just, I don't think there's any need to demonize any particular population, particularly not a young one yeah. for taking on this narrative that's being handed them on a plate by adults, you know, that they're, they're, they're very much encouraged to take by teachers around them, by parents in some cases saying, yes, you know, your body is wrong and uh, we can fix that for you. I mean, that, the adults are the ones that I... Well, that, that's the part that's really astounding, isn't it? Because in the past, nobody encouraged eating disorders or cutting yourself. But um, <laughs> now, know. where where, we, are the, <coughs> where are the adults in the room? <clears throat> I mean, so there, some of them are well-meaning. Well, most of them are well-meaning, I think. But... um. But they are foolish. Uh, it just you know, cutting cutting yourself doesn't get any better because you farmed it out to some surgeon and right. paid them for it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, the surgeon does a much better job. Yeah. Well, yeah. Mm. So uh, you won't get your breasts back. <laughs> so when we're talking about men's issues, I mean, I don't want this to sound sort of too much of a tribal debating point, but is there something to learn for the feminist movement from this experience of being shouted down? I mean, I wouldn't wish it on anybody, and I'm very keen to defend feminists who have this experience, but it does strike me that mm-hmm. there were there were cases not so long ago of people like James Damore at Google who got fired for talking about sex differences, Tim Hunt mm-hmm. who had to resign after making some frankly rather silly remarks about women scientists, and it seems like some of those mm-hmm. uh, so-called cancellations were driven by feminists. So uh, mm. again, I don't I don't want to sort of sound like <laughs> I a see jerk, where you're going, but I just wonder: is there something that we could all learn from this experience that really nobody yes. should be shouted down, including men, right? <laughs> including including people who are who are including men who are putting forth forward views about um, the relationship between the sexes, which you don't yeah. agree with, but you you still want to defend their right to say these things. Yes, I mean, I've got a number of things to say, but broadly, yes, I agree with you. Um, I don't think that every time a feminist speaks, they speak for the whole feminist movement. You know, even even back in the day before all this blew up, I was still quite irritated by some responses to um, good faith claims about sex differences. And I still am. I mean, I, I find it really irritating the way that fellow feminists get incredibly um, nuclearly irate about a claim that they could just say, I think is wrong. <laughs> you know, they don't have to immediately take it as a personal attack. But then, of course, you know, the reasons why women do take those are particularly, why, but why many feminists are particularly worried about claims about sex differences, whether they're true or false, is that we're going to end up on the side that doesn't have any, <laughs> yeah, because they were, you know, that they, turns out to be not yeah. very good at spatial reasoning. 
well, physically they, they, they were unable to past, defend ourselves. To disenfranchise women, yeah. so that that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. but I, I think they're you know, worried. It's, it's it's a defensiveness, yeah, yeah, I think, yeah. about that because you know um, we also know how the most nuanced claim once unleashed into the into the social media world can turn into the most reductive version of itself you yeah. know so you can say yes there's a bell curve and <laughs> you know on average women are not as good at this as men are, are but you know there are many many exceptions and you can say we should never assume in advance that a, a woman any particular woman <laughs> isn't good at this because she might even be better than most men at this for all we know you can say all that but it, how it will come out at the other end is women can't do this they shouldn't be doing it you know leave it to the men so that's that's why the territory is so fraught yeah I think however right. I do agree with you that um that that there has been egregious kind of mistreatment of Men and actually, I can tell a, a confessional story to so that everybody knows I'm not just judging other people because the very first tweet I ever tweeted, <laughs> I think pretty much certainly the one that got any traction whatsoever, and this was way when I had a tiny little account and I was just a boring academic, you know, uh, was about Tim Hunt, and uh, I tweeted something sarcastic that immediately took off, sarcastic about him, right. Um, yeah. Uh scathing, just taking at face value that he'd made these uh these sexist comments about women scientists and like what a dick. And you know, I got a lot of righteous anger behind it as these tweets often do. Um and then a friend of mine approached me and she said I know Tim Hunt and uh, actually he's devastated that his um comments have been taken out of context in this way and that he was making sort of joke and you know you know how things go when people do make jokes they don't think it's going to be reported on social media and go around the world uh as your final sort of epitaph <laughs> so yeah. yeah i um i mean i will I say learned, I'm, i learned something yeah, I mean, i'm in favor of proportionality as well and i will say that like making a wisecrack about someone on twitter it's not quite sort of saying that they should be sacked. And th that's really what bothers me. I mean, no, no, I, I didn't do that. I'm all in favor of free that. speech, actually. And if you think the joke was inappropriate, or you didn't like it, you didn't find it funny, I think that's fine. It's just, especially with Demore, I think uh, that was more of a direct sacking, where I think when the Tim Hunt case, he actually resigned. But yeah, I mean, yeah, I, think I think what I think that you should recognize your own motives, that you're not just a great social justice warrior or a feminist. You're actually, um, you know, cathartically getting rid of some anger or 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 bringing together a peer group behind you in a way that makes you feel good there's there's a whole lot of stuff going on on social media people don't recognize about themselves and and i don't think it's healthy no so. quite yeah the, the your, your point about uh feminists perhaps women more generally feeling defensive about claims of sex differences is well taken i, I i've actually been writing a book about uh, mm -hmm. Young men, in particular, with with a, uh, a an, another author, and so we've delved into this literature quite deeply. And when you mm -hmm. look in it, there there are on average differences, but they cut both ways. I, I mean, it, it is true that on average men have a advantage to spatial reasoning, but women have a verbal advantage. Uh, mm -hmm. So, actually, when you stack it all up, there's 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 some both ways, and really. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be able to talk about those things. Uh, and one of the reasons is because based on different propensities, whether it's personality characteristics or cognitive characteristics, people make different choices. And so uh, I think that's what James Damore was trying to do, was point out maybe it's not such a huge surprise that there are uh, not as many female as male Google engineers because my male mm -hmm. interest just tends to cut a bit more in that direction so yeah i would just i would be very wary of any one factor explanation of those things i mean i think feminists should acknowledge that part of the reason for that the lack of women in any given or in some uh sectors is partly to do with on average the preferences of women but also uh anti-feminist or men or whoever you know whatever the contrast class is mm. should acknowledge that that the sexes have class interests as it were and men do tend to kind of band together feel more comfortable comfortable with each other in certain circumstances and might well prefer to have 
a man over a woman in an employment situation for reasons that aren't strictly to do with their abilities. Mm -hmm. And and I think the same goes in reverse. Mm -hmm. Women sometimes would prefer to have another woman in the team rather than a man. And we should acknowledge that too. So it's not going to be one thing, but yes, it could be both. I've I've read accounts of male nurses because it's a similar thing where often the men are hugely outnumbered in the nursing profession. And the account Mm -hmm. I read of a male nurse sounded very similar to some accounts I've read of women in tech, for example, where they just sort of say, Mm -hmm. well, I just don't really feel I fit in. And so it gave me a little bit more more sympathy for that, for that style of, Mm -hmm. um, of complaint about workplace um, culture. Yeah. Yeah, my, my, my field these days is actually education and, and that the teaching profession is, is of course, massively female-dominated. Do, in New Zealand, mm-hmm. it's it's about 85% in primary schools and 70% in, in secondary schools. And we also see um, pretty poor statistics for boys relative to girls in educational performance. And mm-hmm. some, sometimes I wonder, I mean, it, that that is a very difficult phenomenon to explain. And I certainly don't want to claim that it's just because there are more female teachers. I, I don't think that's so. No. <laughs> but, but, and in fact, there's research to show that... Um, it doesn't matter what sex your teacher is uh, on average. You, uh, whether you're a boy or a girl, you will be taught just as w- well by a man or a woman. But mm-hmm. um, I do sometimes wonder whether the culture of schools thereby becomes such that you have this sense of not fitting in quite as well if you're a boy as you, you might as, as a girl. Mm. It's a, I, th- I mean, I, I haven't got any sort of expertise in this area. I just have, uh, you know... A history of working in higher education and then I have children. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I could say that what's occurs to me about the questions that for me get raised about those sorts of statistics is what is certainly, is there a difference in learning styles on average between boys and girls? And it seems to me that there probably is, you know, is there a difference in develop, rates of development, verbal development between boys and girls? I think there is. Yeah. Um. I mean, I know I've been, I went to speak to, one of my children to a speech therapist once um and uh the waiting room was just full of little boys and yeah. i said to the speech therapist oh there's lots of little boys out there and she said it's always little boys you know she made some joke but you know there is i think there are patterns there and then attentional um issues probably cluster more in one sex than the other and stuff like that so um i it's not it's not set in stone that we value the things we value in the education system just as it's not set in stone that we value um, male-centered cognitive capacities over female ones, you yeah. know that that is is a discussion. I think we could be more open to having about why why the education system rewards the things it does and does it suit everyone. Yeah. And, and and I think it also has to do with uh, the environment, the kind of social environment of of schools. So. Uh, I, I suspect, and, and again, I'm speculating on the basis of some knowledge and some research, but really it's hard to put all of this together. But I, I think perhaps boys benefit from a more structured environment, perhaps mm-hmm. especially as they become adolescents and they, their bodies fill up with testosterone and, and they become pretty restless. And then mm-hmm. I think that a, a kind of lax environment, they will tend to just go off track in more than more than girls who uh, mm. tend tend to possibly stay with the program a bit more so I mean th- mm-hmm. th- these are these are complex questions I guess my, my point about this is that it is important to be able to discuss sex differences without being shouted down as soon as you open your mouth uh, in order to I actually think, so. think all of these things yeah. through properly I think so and I think what's happened um, for many, I, I think for many feminists, not all, but many feminists, um, that the, the whole trans activism stuff has sort of pushed the the social construction of sex difference position to it to such a ridiculous extreme that it's causing people to think, well, hang on a minute, obviously something went wrong. So where did it? So to that extent, they've done us a favor. <laughs> right, right. Yes. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can maybe we can shift in a minute to talking more about the sort of intellectual situation we find ourselves in, just with all this cancel culture and how do we get beyond it. But before that, one last sort of controversial topic I wanted to broach because this is why we had you on for us. So uh, the claim is often heard from the turf side or the so-called transclusionary radical feminist side that the attack on turfs is uh, misogynistic, partly. So all these feminists are being attacked. Um, mm. It does strike me, though, that some of the pioneers of 
sort of trans research like J. Michael Bailey, they were also, you know, they also got in a lot of trouble. They were also quite stoutly attacked. And it also strikes mm. me that if you look, for example, at the video of the event in Auckland with Posey Parker, a lot of the people in the crowd who were involved in the hurly burly, not so much the punching, but in some of the hurly burly, a lot of them were women. So sometimes mm -hmm. I, I'm not so sure that this is uh, a phenomenon that's best explained by misogyny rather than just by whatever else explains the sort of cancer culture we find ourselves in. What, what do you think about that? Um, I think it can be both. Yes, it's usually my answer to all these questions is why, you know, is it this or is it that? Well, why not both? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so yes, J. Michael Bailey got um, a horrible time. Um, and there are men who have had a horrible time um, at the hands of trans activists, you know, going after their jobs, um, send, being the subject of threats and so on. I would say, but around the, in fact, before Bailey, Janice Raymond um, got a terrible time. Sheila Jeffries has had a bad time. So there have been radical feminists who've had uh, threats to their livelihood as well, or their person. Um, on the question of whether it's misogyny based on whether it's men or women doing it, I'm afraid that one's not going to convince me because obviously the standard repost would be in, that women can be misogynist too. You know, in fact, women could be the biggest misogynist. Simone de Beauvoir points it out in the second sex. You know, there's an advantage to some women siding with men against other women. And if you think, you know, women are competitive um, for resources, just like men are competitive for resources uh, in the natural world that happens. And, and women can use um, ideologies, prevalent ideologies against fellow women for personal gain um, or just because they've, you know, they're, they naturally see them as rivals. So that's all suppressed and nobody talks about that, but I think a lot of that is going on. There's also a kind of like pick on her, not me thing yeah. going on, you know? As, so it's, I think yeah. it's like, if you, if you, if, if you've got a power grab going on and you've got people pushing back against the power grab, who are you going to, who are the power grabbers going to focus on? It was the most effective use of their time to focus on, uh, to to really make an example of somebody. Um, it's going to be a woman because both men and women will attack that woman. <laughs> Whereas if it's a man, quite often um, men won't attack the men for it. Women will attack the women. Uh, sorry, women will attack the man, but men aren't as bothered about attacking fellow men for their positions on this stuff. So in this area in particular, it's very effective to attack, attack a woman because you know that both sexes will will join you. Well, it's an, it's an asymmetrical issue as well, isn't it? I mean, uh, but by and large, trans men probably, you know, even if they went into a male prison, it would be them mm. that were, were in danger rather than the other prisoners. Um, and, yes, and likewise, why, why, why would the trans man want to go into a male sporting competition? Uh, so I, I think it is an asymmetrical issue in, in that regard. I think that's true. Um, certainly trans men do not pose the same systematic threat uh, to women's in, uh, men's interests as trans women pose to women's interests um, because, you know, trans women are male <laughs> uh, and trans men are female. Um, there are issues for trans men that I think are reasonable issues. Like I think if you have taken loads of testosterone uh, as a female and you've got a appearance now, which is indistinguishable from a man's, then there is a question about which bathroom you go into and which changing room you go into um, that should, needs to be talked about and addressed uh, responsibly. But it is true that the biggest, the impetus for all this is coming from men. The initial impetus is coming from men. It's men who want to get in to women's sports. It's men who want to get into women's changing rooms. Um, the lawsuits that were initially um, launched, for instance, against Vancouver rape, rape Relief or the petitions that were launched in favour of men getting into women's prisons, you know, they came from men. Now, lots of women then flocked to the cause because, yeah. you know, that's our job <laughs> to be kind and supportive and nice <laughs> and all the rest of it. But I think the impetus came from men, I'm afraid. Yeah. Okay, well, maybe we should shift to this other issue because, or this sort of broader issue, which is why we're having this podcast in the first place and why you're here. Uh, so I understand that you used to be a philosophy instructor, but then you were basically driven out of your job. I'll, I'll let you sort of put it in your own terms. And, and now, as you, you said at the beginning, you're affiliated in some way with this new startup uh, university, the University of Austin. So do you want to just talk about your journey in that regard? Sure. 
Yeah, so I was a um, philosophy lecturer at a British university called the University of Sussex, which is based in Brighton, um, Brighton being the centre of LGBT um, life in the UK, very well known a place. Um, and I was an uncontroversial figure, I think, uh, and not, not an activist in any way. Um, but I got in 20, around 2018, I decided I had to start speaking about the possible consequences of changing the law here. So there was a big push uh, from trans activism and in partnership with the government at the time and the Labour Party, that's the opposition, to um, change the law here so that our existing protections for trans people, which I approve of, um, we have an Equality Act that protects gender reassignment as a protected characteristic. And we have a, we had a, we have a Gender Recognition Act that means you can get a legal change of sex. But trans activists wanted to change those to make them in favour of gender identity, this inner feeling, um, without any necessarily bodily consequence. <laughs> and they wanted to say, you know, you should be able to go wherever you want based on your gender identity, you know, the sports teams, the changing rooms, the rape crisis centres and so on. Um, so I thought that was crazy and started to wonder why fellow academics weren't raising any kind of objections. Lots of academics were very supportive of all this, but there was hardly anyone speaking out in defense of uh, women and girls, I think, and children. So I started to write some blog posts. I gave some talks, uh, immediately became a quite controversial figure. The controversy escalated. <laughs> I wrote a book called Material Girls, um, Why Reality Matters for Feminism. And then fast forward three years down the line and uh, a group of activists decided they were going to mount a sustained campaign to get me out of my job. And so they started coming to my campus, um, putting up posters with my name on them saying I was a transphobe and I needed to be fired, um, putting up stickers, uh, distributing their manifesto, letting off flares, doing graffiti having big protests with like a hundred people on campus wearing masks, holding signs saying stock out mm. and so on. Um, it was very unpleasant. Um, the police were telling me I had to get, I shouldn't come to campus. I should have alter my route when I walked around town and I should have security at home and so on. And so eventually this became unsustainable for me, particularly when my, basically some colleagues at Sussex and academic colleagues in the union um, sided, sided publicly with the protesters against me. I would call them harassers, to be honest. Yeah. Um, at that point, I just thought, sod this. <laughs> I don't want to be here anymore. And I really hadn't been happy there for a few years because of the lack of support and the general ongoing harassment, which was you know, frequent. Um, so I'm out. And then... Uh, since then, I've been writing. I write a column for a, a British publication called Unheard Online. I I do lots of bits and pieces. I also have started a new project called The Lesbian Project with Julie Bindle, where we focus on lesbians, same-sex attracted females and their interests. But I also am affiliated with the University of Austin now, and they are a new university, very much in the early stages, but they're focusing on um, liberal, a classical liberal kind of approach to education and a demonstrable um commitment to free speech yeah this is this is a, a something that's of great interest to james and i we we uh, actually met through the heterodox academy I, i'm not sure ah, if yeah. you're aware of that but oh well, i'm a member oh you're a member so, so they did yeah. they did nothing for me three years ago when well, i joined they were like what well, jo jonathan <laughs> Hyde actually visited wellington and and he convened a meeting right. of, the, of the local members uh, uh, of which it turned out there were two and uh so that's how james, <laughs> and that was you <laughs> james and i got got together then they, and they have received excellent. criticism just to acknowledge what you're saying there that for not having enough teeth and i i agree with that to some extent i think that they can play a role and they can they can maybe mm. impact the atmosphere in other ways and they've clearly chosen that strategy but i think it's also very happy uh, very helpful to have organizations in the states like fire freedom uh the foundation for individual rights and in education which um has a lot more teeth on the legal front and i, I kind of wish heterodox academy did too but. indeed but but in any event you know we've kind of lamented the the demise of the university as a venue for open discussion of ideas and 
of mm-hmm. course, every time someone like you gets hounded out, it gets a little worse because not only uh, has that mm. has that voice been lost, a hundred other voices think that they'd better shut up yeah, at that stage. That's true. That's true. I mean, do you feel that? I feel that tension when I talk about what happened to me. Um, I'm trying to raise awareness so that, you know, institutions become stronger and uh, become better able to deal with that sort of thing when it happens to them. But on the other hand, I'm aware that lots and lots of younger scholars in particular just see what happened to me and think, well, I'm definitely not going to say anything. Yeah, uh, that, I think know, that, why would they? It's certainly certainly true. I, I mean, we, we had a another controversy here in New Zealand about a year and a half ago. You may or may not have heard of it. So, some international figures like Richard Dawkins got involved, but mm-hmm. there was a letter written to a local publication called The Listener, by seven academics uh, criticising the idea that Māori traditional knowledge should be fused with the science curriculum. Um, Mm. And that seemed a reasonable argument to be able to make, but uh, they were immediately uh, called racist and harmful by by, all different different quarters. Now, and three of them who were members of the Royal Society were actually put under investigation by the Royal Society as as a result of this furor. Um, now, one of the things that struck me about them is that at least half of them were in emeritus professor positions and all of them mm-hmm. were late career. And it, it's absolutely mm-hmm. unthinkable that a younger scholar would even try something yeah. like that because yeah. they, they'd be, they would be, suicidal. It'd be the end of their, their career right then and yeah, there. Yeah, it completely so, would. I mean, isn't it terrible that we've got such a reductive view of people's motivations these days that the first thing that people think when they see a letter like that is, oh, it must be racist. Yeah. I mean, I just can't understand how um, in the in academia, and particularly the humanities where you're supposed to understand, like through your exposure to literature, the idea of multiple points of view and richness and ambiguity and ambivalence and liminality and all that stuff, mm-hmm. you you immediately think the only reason anyone would ever say this is because they're a secret racist, and that's just that's this is the evidence. Um, and the same goes for me, obviously, and anyone who says things like me, and you, no doubt, you too as well, is that you will now be irrevocable transphobes <laughs> and bigots no, for having no me doubt. on <laughs> well we're, we're we're all kinds of things for having all kinds of people on on this show so <laughs> we, we we've given we've given up caring I, i've absconded from the university rather than um have you uh, oh well i I, uh, I just came to the conclusion that the game was no longer worth the candle and i i can speak my mind far more freely where i am now yeah and, and exactly the, the intellectual life is, is better and uh it, why, why wouldn't I is, is the thing. So for yeah, me, but I, agree. I, I do worry about the future of the university and wh- whether it even has one if it carries on down this, ro- down this road because it, if it becomes so politically monocultural and so fixed in what, so doctrinal in what you're allowed to say, mm-hmm. it's completely mm-hmm. ab- abdicated its mission. Well, especially ab- because the university seems to have decided to sort of close its mind at precisely the time when we have all these wonderful new technologies like podcasts where people can actually develop yeah. their own networks. Yeah, so I know. That's the real hope. I mean, to answer the worry that you, you had a few minutes ago of like, it, by sharing your story of cancellation, will that discourage others? Well, I think it depends on what people see you do next. And I think, uh, I mean, Brett Weinstein, for example, at Evergreen State was one of the first people who kind of got forced out of university. I guess in his case, he resigned too, but you can understand why. But then to see him mm-hmm. sort of, okay, maybe he said some things I don't agree with, but, but basically he's gone from strength to strength. He's built up a huge following. So I think that if the University of Austin can kind of prove that you can leave traditional academia and not only have a following of your own and, and produce ar- good articles and things, but also build up mm-hmm. an actual educational institution, that would really be a, a beacon of hope. Yeah, I hope they manage it. I mean, obviously I have, I'm limited in my influence generally, but I do, I think that there's a, I agree with you that, I agree with you about a lot of what you just said. I certainly think that there's a very rich time actually for critical thinking. Um, it's just not taking place in the academy. Yeah. Um, and people are very intellectually energized uh, and that's great, but I do worry about silos. I mean, you know, the people the person you just mentioned there and i don't have i don't have much exposure to his stuff but you know i have noticed generally speaking in the say the sort of vaccine skeptic world or or maybe the gender critical world you know that they there's kind of factions there too you know and people go for the content that confirms 
their own uh, preferences and probably biases. And, and um, the social media and, a- a- um, algorithms feed it to you. So Yeah, exactly. And we are, in, you know, the good thing about a university, I, I thought, was we were supposed to be encouraged to expose ourselves to opposing points of view. And we could be civil and respectful to each other and go for a drink afterwards as well. And it didn't have to be this sort of life or death fight for, you know, your worldview over their worldview. And we're, that's what we're missing is an environment where you can have very contradictory and even antagonistic um, people duking it out verbally, but without the world falling apart. <laughs> so people around could then see, oh, it's okay. You know, it's okay to, for people to disagree. Um, it, yeah, I don't in, know. In fact, I, that's, lost that. I mean, to me, that's the most productive path to better ideas. I, I mean, mm-hmm. we, we can talk to people we agree with and then we'll have our ideas confirmed. Uh, or we can go into a conversation actually not trying to convince somebody with a different point of view that they're wrong and we're right, but rather mm-hmm. with a mind open to learning something that you didn't know before. Yeah. It seems to me when both parties do that, especially when they're scholars with a lot of knowledge about something, that's actually mm-hmm. what leads to the most productive outcomes. Yeah. I listen there's a there's a really great um online film of a, a debate between Roger Scruton and Terry Eagleton and I commend your listeners to so seek it out because they those are two thinkers who could not be more different in their presuppositions. I mean Roger Scruton is a archetypal social conservative um and Terry Eagleton is a Marxist um and they really don't like what each other stands for in many ways but they're so civil to each other and yeah. they're so polite to each other and they have shared laughs at various points they're both humorous it's just really a paradigm of how you could do this stuff right yeah there's some um, there's some gems on YouTube of that sort of thing like uh, Copplestone the Jesuit historian and philosopher and Bertrand Russell talking about the existence right. of God. It's unbelievable. It's like they're completely different species or different culture. People talking you know, so well and so fluently and so politely about these fundamental yes. issues. It's sort of like, where, how did we get here from there? You know? Yes, exactly. We, we are not civilized anymore. So, no. so it would seem. Now, the, the University of Ox- Austin, it is a bricks and mortar university, is it? It's not just online? No, not yet. Not yet. I mean, I mean, they're really so early on. Um, people should go and look at their website because I must admit I don't keep up to date, but I'm pretty sure they haven't built anything yet. So I think they're still fundraising. So they have like one, they have courses there and there's going to be a course um, this summer like there was last. I think they're called the Forbidden Courses, but they're basically, you know, um, encouraging people to think critically about uh, um, taboo <laughs> subjects. What what t- subjects that have become taboo in a very restricted university environment, and they're not necessarily taboo at all for most people. Um, so I did a course there last year about feminism, and I um, I taught uh, all different kinds. Like I basically encouraged students to think about the differences between uh, first wave feminism, radical feminism. Uh, intersectional feminism, uh, sort of this reactionary feminism that you mentioned earlier, coming from people like Mary Harrington, and uh, and that people could say whatever they liked about it. And we had some very conservative men in the class, and we had some quite progressive women, um, and, and then some neutrals, and it was really fascinating. Well, lo- <laughs> long, long may it last, and, and I, ho- I hope that you managed to save the university as, a, as an idea uh, through, oh, through, so. <laughs> through your work there. I mean, there, there's some good people involved, Barry Weiss and Niall Ferguson, or, or fairly big names yeah. that hopefully will attract Joshua students. Katz, and, the class assistant. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and they've got another um, great roster this year. Um, Ian Hersiali is involved as well. She was last year. Uh, all sorts of interesting people. So. Yeah, and I'm actually going to be doing a debate this time with um, Christina Hoff Sommers, who has, oh, has given lo- written I'll... loads about how feminism's gone wrong, and I'm going to argue with her. I'll, I'll, be, lis- <laughs> I'll be listening to that one um, with, okay. with my ears full, fully open. I don't envy you having to argue against her. I don't. I don't envy her no. having to argue against you, mind you. So, <laughs> yeah. should, should be a good one. And look, um, yeah. Kathleen, th- thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a really great conversation and uh, oh. it's made me think of some, some things that I hadn't before and that, that's something that I always like to get out oh, of a great. conversation. Great. Well, me too. Yeah. Me too. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks a lot.